Terraria is a game that's been around since 2011. Throughout the years and all of the, uh, final updates, many players from across the world have attempted to carve their names into the game's long history. As time has gone on, people have pushed the game further and further. Today, I'll be showing you how I managed to push through one of the hardest, most unfair, most punishing challenges. Welcome to Death Mode Master Mode Hardcore. For those unfamiliar, Calamity is the fourth most downloaded mod, and easily the biggest content mod. Calamity adds two new difficulties, Revengeance and Death, that add way too much for me to cover everything, but to keep it simple they make everything way harder. Nobody on YouTube was crazy enough to try this before me, and I've only seen one person claim online to do this. So if you'd like to mend the damage these runs did to my brain, you could subscribe. Bro, this video is long. Get to the important stuff. You know, I bet this isn't even that hard anyway. It is hard. I promise, let the first guy talk again, okay? Fine. My assistant, who definitely isn't just me with a weird filter, has given me a video presentation on why Death Master Hardcore is so difficult. Welcome to Master Mode, you got your triple HP enemies, you got your triple damage enemies, you got your up to 1.5 times plus damage, you got your up to 2.5 times plus HP, and of course it gets worse because welcome to Death Mode, you got reduced and capped iframes, you got life regen nerf, you got massively nerfed life steal, and of course extra debuff damage, because you know, you know, enemy and boss AI is more aggressive than mobile, so bosses have extra phases, and of course you can't use the nerfs during boss fights, and I have to do all of this without dying. Yay! Yeah, it's a lot, but it gets worse. The first 118 of these runs were done in Malice mode, a difficulty so terrible and poorly balanced it ended up getting removed from the mod. As for the runs after the first 118, I added something else to make it harder, but I'll explain it when we get there. For now, let me show you the first attempt. I'm sure that this doesn't have any implications for future runs. Uh, okay, fine, there's a death montage. Ugh, okay. Clearly that's not working. Let me just, uh... There we go. It took 87 attempts, but a boss was finally down. Even if it was only King Slime and I immediately got folded by Desert Scourge, it was nice to have some serious progress on the board. Things slowed down until attempt 114, where I made a massive leap in progress. I'd love to show you, but I ended up deleting it to make space to record more runs. I do have the last two bosses recorded though. To fill in the gap between King Slime and this run, I employed the most talented artist to ever walk the earth to craft a perfect video explaining what happened to the other bosses. Here's the two bosses, the only remaining footage of attempt 114.
If you're wondering what killed Attempt 114, it was the Destroyer. Not really sure how the fight went, but it was Malice Mode Destroyer, so I probably got ruined. This massive leap in progress was nice, but I was hit with news only a few runs later that would change the run forever. Malice Mode was removed from the game. In its place, Attempt 119 would be the first where I used Nightmare Fuel, an item designed to make boss fights more difficult, and to make a strategy I call Heal Stall completely impossible. Allow me to explain. Nightmare Fuel is the name of the mod that I've created to assist me with this playthrough. It adds a few quality of life features to streamline the most tedious parts of hardcore runs, which I'll explain as they come up. But the main thing it adds is a new item called the Nightmare Fuel. Creative, right? The effects of the Nightmare Fuel item are activated just by holding it in your inventory. Upon summoning a boss, a max hit counter activates. Each hit you take increases the counter until it hits 10, which instantly kills you with a nice, encouraging chat message. The only way to avoid the counter increasing is through the use of a dodge accessory or a set bonus like the Hallowed Album. This Eye of Cthulhu fight demonstrates how the hit cap works, and as you can see, each time I take damage, the number appears right above me. This is the very encouraging death message, by the way. You'd think having no malice mode would make my life easier. So what attempt am I on now? 130, 150, even maybe 170? No, I was at 252. That is 138 deaths. I over doubled my death count without even making a sliver of progress. But it wasn't all bad news. I had discovered something in the Calamity Discord and I wanted to test it. I had spent month after month throwing myself against a brick wall over and over, but now I actually had a glimmer of hope. So what was it? No, 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 you're kidding. The Glimmer of Hope is not a random pre-hard mode summon weapon. Actually, it is. On the 7th of October, 2022, the Calamity mod had an update, reworking the dank stuff, and it was busted. The damage of the weapon was buffed from 7 to 16. Not only that, but the velocity of the minion was tripled. Because of the damage and speed increase, this weapon was overperforming, even in hard mode. This thing was beating out all of the best summons pre-hard mode, and it sounds like a joke, but it could even compete with post-golem summons. With this knowledge, my new strategy was born. Rush the weapon as fast as I could. The hive mind might not be the easiest boss to kill early, but getting the dank stuff allows me to melt through the rest of pre-hard mode easily. While I fight Skeletron Prime, let me tell you something else. There was also another broken summoner weapon at the time. The early hard mode mounted scanner was also overperforming in the exact same way the dank stuff was. Defeating Prime gave me access to the second tier of hard mode ore, making it obtainable. I barely had to try for the mech bosses, and so I thought Plantera wouldn't be too much worse. I carved out a basic arena, ready to take her on. This was the first death that actually stung. Each death before this one was just a gameplay error. This one was a planning error too. 
These broken weapons led to overconfidence, and I didn't prepare my arena properly. Plantera's spore clouds blended into the background walls, making it really hard for me to see where it was safe and where it wasn't. I was not just disappointed in myself, but I was also out of time, because the next Calamity patch came out. Two certain weapons were changed. The dank staff was nerfed back into its rightful place, 16 damage back to 7, and the extra velocity did stay, but the time between attacks was changed from 10 frames to 24. These changes made sense, and the staff was now balanced. You could even say perfectly. The mounted scanner though was completely butchered. The fire rate for the minion lasers was cut by 73%. This weapon is basically useless now, as there are plenty of strong summon weapons at this tier that just outclass it. It may take a while, but I'll get back to this point without these weapons. I have to. Sixty-two attempts later, I had a more refined strategy, one that was honest. The sea searing and slithering eels made for an excellent early hard mode carry. It even felt better against Plantera, especially with an arena painted black letting me see projectiles clearly. This made the Plantera fight much more doable, and this time, it was a successful fight. Then I took on the Calamitous clone, not sure what to expect, nor my best options. I reached the end phase, but died to the bullet hell. This was the third crushing loss, and I couldn't handle it anymore. At this point, my mental state was not just in decline, but broken. My real life was doing just as bad as this run was too. It was finally time to give up. It's clear this wasn't sustainable for my well-being. A lot changed over these four months. Things got a hell of a lot worse, but then things started to get better. It was the toughest part of my life for sure. There was a lot of confrontation with my darkest thoughts, and I had to learn how to move beyond them. But I still had a lingering feeling, one that dragged me right back here. It felt like it was finally time to return and cut this thread hooking into my flesh. It was now 2023. The year had turned over and it felt good to be back. I quit after attempt 314, and it only took 7 attempts for me to get a new best run, taking down Calamitous. Not too long after, on attempt 343, I tied that run. 358 followed, tying it again. Instead of being disappointed to not make any progress, my mindset had shifted, and I was happy since I knew I was becoming more and more consistent. 375 was a new best, taking down Astromorius before falling to the Leviathan. Consistency is great, but I wanted a breakthrough. And only two attempts later, 377, I found that breakthrough.
377 was a great run. A little disappointing to lose so close to the end of the fight for sure, but it was the largest leap in progress in a while. Strategies for not just that fight, but bosses after were forming in my head. I knew I could make a huge leap. All I needed was a good run. Little did I know, I wouldn't have to wait very long. While my death to a normal enemy sucked, it taught me a lesson. I didn't realize how much damage pillar enemies could even do. It was disappointing, but still, this much progress in just two attempts is completely unheard of. Eight attempts later I made it to the same point before dying to Astrum Deus, the boss on your screen right now. That death was caused by me being overzealous and not preparing properly. Attempt 388, just 10 after my big breakthrough, I made it back to my best. I survived the lunar events, and now I'm fighting Astrum Deus. 
This time, I didn't use the Terra Prisma, since the Stardust Dragon stuff looked like it was in a perfect place to melt Astrum Deus into pieces. It was by no means a clean fight, but the strategy worked excellently. I was up to Moonlord. After preparing on a practice world, I decided to take the Moonlord on. I'm not going to show the full fight, it was kind of a disaster all around. The nerves got to me and I just crumbled under the pressure. Most deaths I immediately quit the world, but this time I just sat here for a moment. I thought I made good preparation, but it was clear that my build and dodging ability was lacking. It took 11 more attempts, but on attempt 399, I returned with a different, more powerful build. I considered the game to be split into three segments, pre-hard mode, hard mode, and post moon mode. That makes this moment the first time I made it to the final split, though knowing what came next definitely tempered my hopes for what would follow. The biggest problem with hardcore is that the further each run makes it, the more you lose when you die. Any death from here on out would mean it would take even longer to reach a new best. With this death, my attempt counter was now in the 400s. I definitely felt the momentum from breakthrough after breakthrough begin to fade away. Attempt 405. No footage, but I died in the post Moonlord dungeon while farming for a weapon. This run definitely reinvigorated the spark in me. Attempt 114, the first solid run way back in August 2022, had 36 hours of playtime. 405 took down Moonlord in only 6 hours. Now the question is for my next post Moonlord attempt. Is the third time the charm?
Every attempt always starts the same, by sorting my inventory. To really get started, I place down my storage units, a workbench, and I craft a lot of auto houses. I use 6 auto houses to make my home base, and in other biomes I build sets of 3. These sets of 3 become the pylon stations. In the early game, I tend to dip into these surface caves. If I die, I can just do another run, and if I get lucky, well it's a great head start. This time, I found a dead man's chest. I've died to them enough to know how they spawn. I take out the three explosives, block myself in to dodge boulders and darts, and then I open the chest. The band of regeneration is kind of mediocre, but it's whatever. Recall potions are vital though, so I'm very happy to get them. The rest of the caving wasn't too interesting, but I did manage to get my hands on some important stuff. The cloud in a bottle is fantastic for early movement, and I managed to pick up four life crystals as well. Anyone who plays Master Mode can tell you how even basic enemies can one-shot you from full at 100 HP. Having 180 HP means I can take one or two hits at least. I don't want to get too greedy, so I return to the surface since I do need to do some overworld exploring before nightfall. Heading east, I find the desert oasis. This is one of the best places to fish in the early game. I start fishing for an oasis crate, aiming to obtain the magic conch. With the conch, I can instantly teleport to either ocean, meaning I can safely avoid the treacherous jungle or the corruption biome. Soon enough, I get my hands on one, and... Welcome to the Sulphur Sea, a biome added in the Calamity mod that replaces one of the oceans. This is where my early game fishing really happens. To make my fishing area, I use bombs to blow up the sand below. This makes sure the rising bubbles don't reach me from underwater and instantly kill me. It also destroys steam vents, which can fire out steam that also can instantly kill me. Building the houses lets NPCs arrive, reducing enemy spawn rates to near zero. However, I still keep my eyes out for soul flounders. If I aggro one, their mist attack can threaten to instantly kill me. If so many things can instantly kill you, there has to be some reason to fish here, right? There are four different useful items, three exclusive to this biome, that are all obtainable here. First, the Reaver Shark has had its 1.4 nerfs reverted in Calamity. That means, just like the old days, you can mine Hellstone before defeating a boss. High defense armor and powerful weapons in the early game are especially good in Hardcore too. Secondly, the Abyssal Amulet adds the powerful Riptide debuff to all of your weapons. I don't fish for this, but the high catch rate basically guarantees it in every single run. More damage is always good anyways. Third, the Alluring Bait is a very good accessory to have. You get more fishing power, and you get more potion fish per yield. Finally, Planty Mush, the junk item in the Sulphur Sea, is actually really good. Each block sells for 6 silver each, which really adds up when you have 1000. I return home to open crates. I picked up the enchanted sundial, sailfish boots, and a tsunami in a bottle. The sundial will be upgraded into a portable sundial, and the other two are just awesome movement accessories. However, I do need to return to the sulfur sea, as there's one more thing I need to do. On the beach, I set up a platform off the ground. This biome has an enemy called the Trasher, which when defeated, spawns the Anglotown NPC. Also, if a Trasher gets the last hit on an Angler, the Angler will drop a golden fishing rod. To exploit this, we can stack two Trashers on top of one another, kill one, spawning the Angler, who takes damage from the other Trasher, and then you got yourself a golden fishing rod. It can take a little bit of time to get multiple Trashers, but it is extremely consistent. Just don't get hit by a Trasher yourself, because it's likely going to insta-kill you. A couple of anti-grinding items from my quality of life mod come into play here. First, the power pole and golden fishing rod combine to make the power pole plus, which is just the power pole, but with more fishing power and the ability to fish in lava. Secondly, I craft the coin engine. The coin engine costs a lot of platinum to make, but it gives you infinite platinum. This one could be more controversial, but fishing in a place where it's 100% safe AFK does the same thing as this item. The only difference is time. I use a gravitation potion I got from a crate to go up to space. Calamity Mod's planetoids provide useful stuff such as Drayden cell factories, herb bags, ores, and life crystals. Luckily, I also found a sky island which provides sunplate, clouds, and rain clouds, which are all used in plenty of early game recipes. I decide to take what I have and return home before a swarm of harpies can end my run. Now that I have a real foothold in the early game, I decide now is the time to properly explore the underground.
Because grinding bone serpents can take such a long time if you're unlucky, my mod adds a recipe to convert the Bladecrest Oath Sword into the Old Lord Claymore by farming Demonic Bone Ash. This weapon is going to carry me until the Wall of Flesh, so getting it as soon as possible is imperative. With the Claymore, mining Hellstone is super safe. After picking up a bunch, I return home to put them in storage. With Hellstone bars, I craft a full set of Molten Armor and a Hellfire Arena. Molten Armor is buffed to provide lava resistance and fire immunity in Calamity, making lava much easier to work with. The Hellfire Arena is the first of many arena builders, which are items that build arenas for you. The Hellfire Arena is designed for the Wall of Flesh. The Goblin Army is still extremely easy. A simple lava setup with a box is all you need. The only problem is the sorcerers who I can easily block with my sword. I realized that I forgot to find the Goblin Tinkerer, who I really should have picked up as soon as I could. Ah well. Eventually, I find him and bring him to the cabin pylon. I bought a Tinkerer's Workshop and two pairs of rocket boots. One pair is for Terra Spark boots down the line, but during this time, there was actually an even better pair of boots. Calamity Fairy Boots are insanely strong compared to Vanilla, so strong in fact that after this run they were moved to being a hard mode accessory. These boots provide more movement speed than Terra Spark, as well as a free 10 defense and 4 life regen on top. There's no better option until you defeat all 3 mech bosses, so these stay equipped until then. Using Vile Powder and Crimstone, I craft another arena builder, the Blood Splatter Bomb. This bomb creates a local mini Crimson Biome where I can fight the Brain of Cthulhu. I forgot to fight a certain fan favorite. You already know who it is, just play the music already.
death of the hive mind caused the aerolite ore in the sky to become mineable, so upwards I go. Even after this many attempts, mining aerolite is still such an enjoyable experience. This, this sound design got me questioning myself for real. With Aerolite, I can finally craft a bundle of balloons, which might be just one of the most goaded accessories of all time. Now that I've got my accessories in order, I realize that Desert Scourge exists and I need to fight it. Underneath the desert is the Sunken Sea Biome, which has a lab in it. This lab has a schematic that I need to progress the game, as well as unlock a recipe for a weapon that I want to use. I entered, took out the turrets, and collected the schematic. For the last bosses in pre-hard mode, I switch over to a mage setup for more raw DPS. For weapons, I craft the trade winds, and the new schematic allows me to craft the pulse pistol. I craft the mana flower for my last accessory slot, and I switch my armor to aerospec with the magic headpiece. I was ready to take on Skeletron, but I forgot to get magic power and mana regeneration potions. As a result, my DPS is lower, meaning this fight is more difficult. Because I'm using a real weapon, I'll explain the basic strategy. During the fight, I use the Pulse Pistol when multi-targeting the hands, and then Trade Winds for its superior single target damage. When the head isn't spinning, you want to be close enough to the head to avoid the homing skulls, but distant enough to not get hit when it starts spinning. Enter the dungeon looking for three items. First, the Muramasa, how you doing, is a sword that I'll need near the end of the game for a super strong melee weapon. Second, the Cobalt Shield provides knockback immunity, and its upgrades are used from this point all the way until the very end of the game. Finally, the Staff of Necrostiocytes is a summon weapon dropped by Dark Casters. I need this weapon for a post Moonlord upgrade, so farming it now before the Plantera dungeon or Moonlord dungeon makes the most sense.
That fight took a lot of time, since I still had forgotten my magic power and regen potions. Regardless, the slime god flees, and I get my treasure back. One of the items I get is the electrolyte gel pack, which I use immediately. This upgrade permanently increases adrenaline damage output and reduction by 15% and 5% respectively. I completely forgot to explain rage and adrenaline, so let me go over them now. I also receive a powerful crafting material called Purified Gel. The armor set crafted using it can even rival some hard mode gear in terms of raw stats, so crafting it is an immediate priority for me. I craft a magic set and equip it straight away, ready to take on the Wall of Flesh. After the wall was defeated, my world was forever changed. A strip of corruption, a strip of hollow, and a starborn meteor plunged into the earth. The second split of the game has begun, and it's a big step up from the beginning. First things first, I place down my relic and open the treasure bag. I take the demon heart, granting me another accessory slot. Next, I go to the angler and purchase fin wings from the shop. They're a really good pair of wings, they just don't get used due to fishing quests being, you know, terrible. After getting my wings, I make my way to the ocean and block myself in like this. Then I increase spawn rates massively by using a battle cry and starting a blood moon. The goal is to get a pirate map to force an invasion, black ink which I can craft into black lenses, and shark fins which I need for a boss summon. Pirate Invasion is mostly pointless, aside from one god tier item. The coin gun, when combined with infinite money glitches or a coin engine, has some of the highest DPS available. It's cheesy for sure, but I'm more than consistent enough with other strategies, which in my mind gives me permission.
move the Oath Sword to the fifth slot, leaving a slot open for another item. All I need to do now is find the wizard. That's right, the wizard sells the Rod of Discord. Thank you, Calamity Mod devs, you seriously saved my life here. I went back down to the Sunken Sea to take on the Hard Mode Giant Clan, who now drops Mollusk Husks. Mollusk Armor is actually really strong, but it has a really bad set bonus of lowering your speed, meaning you can't run away as easily from bosses. I found a workaround, however. Mixed armor sets. Most boot pieces of armor don't provide damage and just increase movement speed. However, Mollusk Shell Leggings are an exception, raising damage by 12% and crit by 4% at the cost of some movement speed and a set bonus. Crunching the numbers, the cost of the set bonus is outweighed by the increased damage. Before I return to boss hunting, I need to do a couple more things to set me up for the rest of the game. I fish in the Hallow for crates and fishes of light. Crates are for ores, and fishes of light can be right-clicked to get souls of light, which is very nice as it saves time farming enemies. Next, I have my demon altars in the corruption, providing me with souls of night. This is why I chose only to fish in the Hallow, since I wouldn't need fishes of night. Ores don't actually spawn from demon altars in Calamity, instead the first tiers spawn from the wall of flesh, and the next tiers as you defeat the mechanical bosses. Then I return home, and finally combine goggles, sunglasses, a suspicious looking eye, a mechanical eye, and a trifold map to create... Ahem... <clears throat> the Ancient Master's Map of the Lost King's Great Ancestors. This item reveals the whole map instantly, which is really useful when searching for specific structures. Finally, I use the Luminescent Sky, which creates a massive arena across the whole world. I'll use this arena for almost every single boss left in the game, obviously there's exceptions though. The last thing I need to do now is round out my build by upgrading my accessories. First, I use the souls to upgrade the counter scarf into the evasion scarf, which gives more true melee damage, which is kind of irrelevant for me, but the dash is better, which is really nice. Next is the Ankh Shield, which is a pain now, but the upgrades later and the usefulness is far too important to pass on. Finally, I craft the mechanical boss summons and arguably the most important accessory in hard mode. I can only describe it as essential, with a niche perfect for hardcore runs. The Amalgamated Brain and its upgrade is the only dodging accessory in the game that provides offensive buffs. 10% damage, and after a dodge, you get 10% more summon damage and 10% crit rate for all classes. This pre-mechanical boss accessory stays equipped until almost the very end of the game. I'm not kidding, its niche is that strong. After all of the preparation, it's now time for me to decommission all of these old machines.
the mechs down, I have access to plenty of upgrades. I could fight some of Calamity's early HOD mode bosses now, but nothing they provide me is at all useful right now. The first upgrade is easy, since I already have all of the materials on hand. Fairy Boots are finally dethroned by Terra Spot Boots' new upgrade, Angel Treads. Thin Wings served me well, but Angel Treads has a specific synergy with Hoppy Wings, providing you with a 20% movement speed buff, as well as a feather attack to all of your weapons. In terms of vertical mobility, other wing options are superior, but Hoppy Wings have identical stats to Thin Wings vertically, making this a direct upgrade in my case. The next boss on my list is Plantera, and I quickly learned that digging out and painting a perfect arena every single run was going to be a nightmare. After a few runs, I bit the bullet and made a mod to auto-build the arena for me. Thing is, it is heavy on the game. If you end up downloading my mod after this video, make sure to save before using it, because it's probably going to crash your game. I craft a max life fruit and a blood orange, increasing my maximum HP by 125. I also craft a portable bulb, a summoning item for Plantera. Plantera is the first fight I have to plan for, as the coin gun strategy requires more effort on my end to make work. The gun doesn't pierce, meaning I have to clear the tentacles before I deal any significant damage. The weapon I chose for this was the flamethrower. It kind of sucks in the actual fight, as you'll see. I mean, I'm sure there were better options, but since this run, Calamity is ported to 1.4.4, and I'm sure the flamethrower would do much better there. Instead of mixed armor, I switch over to a full Chlorophyte set. The ring set bonus can deal a lot of group damage to the tentacles, which is much more important than pure single target damage. The extra healing is pretty nice on top of that. I headed into the undergrowth, seeking out the first of the biggest walls to my victory here. Many of the souls, my previous attempts that guided me here shriveled away in fear. I was alone. Only a few whispers remained, pushing me forward. The silence was deafening, but it was time. Despite not dodging very well, I defeated Plantera, giving me access to a whole bunch of new stuff. Ectoplasm is safely farmable by summoning King Slime in the dungeon, so I'll just use an NPC to buy it instead. I start building a surface mushroom biome to get the truffle NPC to arrive. It was shroom my time. While I wait for the truffle to arrive, I go back to mine more Chlorophyte. I also head to the underground to get Perennial Ore, which is generated after killing Plantera. The Chlorophyte will be converted to Shroomite, and the Perennial Bars will go towards Life Alloy, an important Calamity ingredient. I returned to pick up a couple things from the NPCs. I bought the Auto Hammer for the Shroomite, and then I went to the Cyborg and bought a load of Nanites which I need for later, as well as Rocket Freeze. I craft the Shroomite Helmet and the Shroomite Breastplate. The Helmet gives Rocket Buffs, and the Breastplate provides great stats. However, instead of using the Shroomite Leggings, I bring back the Mollusk Shell Leggings. This is because the Shroomite set bonus kinda sucks, and the raw stats are just more useful. Combining Shroomite bars and Rocket 3s, I also make mini nukes, which have a massive explosion radius for immense group and single target damage. I finally realized that I forgot to fight the Calamitous clone, who drops Ashes of Calamity, so uh, let's handle that. With this gear, the fight was pretty easy. I only got hit once in the whole fight. 
Next on my do now for later list is the plantation stuff, which is a weapon I'll upgrade later. I start by finishing off the flesh of infidelity. I take the staff of necrostia sites I farmed for in that dungeon ahead of time and combine it with an imp staff, a belladonna spirit staff, and a scab ripper. The last thing I need for a plantation staff is the blade staff, which drops from the queen slime. First treasure bag, I get a gelatinous pillion and the blade staff. Perfect. Now that I have the plantation staff, there is one more quick loose end. I craft a cryo key and a snow biome soul. With cryogen down, I now have access to cryonic ore, which is useful for life alloy and shield upgrade. I use the cryonic bars to craft an ornate shield, which is used for an upcoming recipe. I also craft Cores of Calamity, which are made by combining the three essences, Ectoplasm and Ashes of Calamity. It's time to craft an accessory that remains viable for half of the remaining playthrough. Any Calamity player will tell you that Asgard's Valor is a fantastic accessory. It's a combination of the Ornate Shield and the Ankh Shield, meaning it compresses another accessory slot with absolutely no downsides. The only time I ever take this accessory off after I get it is just to upgrade it. Next, I use two cores of Calamity and a Ranger Emblem to make the Deadshot Brooch, an accessory that boosts range damage, crit chance, and increases projectile velocity. Because Asgard's Valor compresses the dash and the shield into one accessory, I can stack the Ranger Emblem and the Deadshot Brooch for even more damage. Now it's time to take on the Event Moons. I was put off from them in previous runs after a death that occurred during a Frost Moon, but now I'm willing to take the risk for the really good items available. The checklist will show what I'm looking for. While I grind Stardust, I'll cover why those three items made the event moons worth it. Firstly, the Necromantic Scroll is a required accessory for Summoner, which I will be soon switching to after I obtain a certain summon weapon. Black Fairy Dust is used for Tattered Fairy Wings, which has better verticals than Harpy Wings and increases damage and crit by 5%. I'm willing to trade off the horizontal movement synergy with Angel Treads for pure damage. Finally, the Snowman Cannon is a super strong weapon that'll help me defeat Golem, Plaguebringer Goliath, and the Empress of Light. The AoE helps with Golem's body and PPG's minions, while the homing rockets shore up my accuracy, resulting in more consistent damage against fast moving targets. Now, I use a Comet Shard to increase my max mana, craft the Astral Chunk, and then summon the boss.
After defeating Astrum Aureus, I was rewarded with a Starlight Fuel Cell, permanently increasing my adrenaline damage output by another 15%, as well as the damage reduction by another 5%. But I wasn't interested in celebrating. Time to put the Snowman Cannon to use. Dread fills the air as I equip my new Pixel. A plague had befallen the jungle. With Golem down, we take a break from the boss rush, as I need to hunt down some newly obtainable resources and some upgrades. The Recon Scope is an accessory that Ranger players can viably run from this point to the very end of the game, so crafting it now is just a no-brainer. Now it was finally time to visit the Abyss, which I skipped in pre-hard mode. With the Pixel in hand, going down there was now worth it. Scoria Ore is the last ore I need for Life Alloy, a super important crafting material. I used the Sea King to give me infinite breath before descending. After mining Scoria, I also farmed the new plague enemies in the jungle for plague cell canisters. Plague cell canisters are required for an armor set I want to make, an accessory, as well as summoning the next boss. I return back to my base, ready to craft two items. One, the hero for this upcoming boss fight, the other, who starts the boss fight. The next boss fight, the plague bringer Goliath, inflicts an extremely potent debuff, Plague. Plague disables your regen, causes you to lose 15 health every second, reduces your damage output by 15%, and it reduces your vision. Every source of plague immunity requires PBG to be defeated, except one. One bottle of water, some B-Wax, and plague cell canisters craft the alchemical flask, which provides immunity to plague and causes your attacks to fire off plague seekers, which deal 30 typeless damage. Immunity to Plague turns this fight from hard to manageable. The second item is the Abomination, PBG's summoning item. This boss killed one of my best runs, but I was more prepared than ever. This run would not end the same way as 377 did.
used to really hate this boss, but after these runs, I've grown to really enjoy the fight. It feels like Queen Bee, obviously, but the diagonal dash and managing the minions adds a lot of depth, even if you ignore the Plague Nuke Barrage. Looking back on this fight, Coin Gun did way less than I thought it would. If I were to do this fight again, I would have only used the Snowman Cannon the entire time. With the Plaguebringer Goliath down, I can craft Plaguebringer Armor, the most powerful summoner set available until Moon Lord is defeated. To use it, however, I would need a good weapon to pair it with. A weapon that has my name written on it. The Empress fight is not too different compared to vanilla. It's much faster and a few attacks are tweaked, but I can still keep up. In Calamity, Terra Prisma is now part of the normal loot table, so I don't have to fight Daytime Empress, which is a huge lifesaver. I now have the best weapon in the game and a super strong weapon, however I have no gear to take advantage of it. I start with the armor. The Plaguebringer set is actually pretty easy to craft. All you need is a B armor piece, infected armor plating from PBG, and some Plague Cell canisters. The chess piece also requires two alchemical flasks, so I de-equip my current one and craft a second one. The leg piece requires flower boots, which I prepared for in pre-hard mode by getting an extra pair. When I said I was optimized, I wasn't lying. As for accessories, Calamity has a lot of good summoner accessories too. I start by crafting two papyrus scarabs, then I realized I never beat Aquatic Scourge, who I need a kill to get the nuclear rod. Here's the very long and very intense fight. Thirteen seconds. Uh, I was definitely faring for my life, yeah. But in seriousness, I can now use corroded fossils to get myself a nuclear rod. Then I craft a jelly charge battery and farm the underground astro for a starbuster core. Combining these three accessories together with some life alloy gets me the star tainted generator. The star tainted generator gives two minion slots, adds an explosion attack to my minions, increases their damage, and lets them apply three different damage debuffs. I also craft the Status Blessing, which gives another two minion slots, 10% summon damage, minion knockback, and makes minions inflict holy flames. My minions were stacking DOT like hell. I also craft the Miracle Fruit, which I could have crafted after beating Golem, but better late than never I guess. The next boss on my list is the Lunatic Cultist and all of the pillars. I won't be fighting Moonlord yet, but access to Lunar Fragments makes the rest of the bosses I need to defeat much, much easier.
After taking down the cultist, the four pillars appeared. I returned home, placed the ancient manipulator into the crafting interface, and headed east. I pick up the last of the fragments before leaving and rejoining the world. This stops Moonlord from arriving. I have a few other bosses to fight and gear to prepare before I'm even ready for Moonlord. Stardust fragments can be used to craft the Stardust Dragon Star and upgrade Status Blessing into Status Curse. This gives a third bonus minion slot and adds Shadow Flame to the list of debuffs. Overall, pretty nice upgrade. The Stardust Dragon looks like it's in a perfect place to melt Astrum Deus into pieces again. After defeating Astrum Deus, I can finally mine the Astral Ore from the Meteor. For Moonlord, it's time to return to Mage. Using Astral Bars, I craft a set of Astral Armor and the Ethereal Core, another permanent mana upgrade. For a weapon, I'm going with the Swarmer, a combination of the Bee Gun and the Wasp Gun for ultimate insect destruction. I needed the best pair of wings I could get. Fishron wings were the first I thought of.
fight was pretty clean, but I felt my damage was lacking. This is when I finally remembered my magic potions that I should have had since Skeletron. At the same time, I remembered that Ravager exists and I should fight it for the rage upgrade. The first attempt, the boss despawned since I was too far away. Second time, let's see. With my rage upgraded, it was time to face Moonlord. This is the fourth run to make it to this point. One of them died here. Beating Moonlord would make this tied for best run yet. I had to swallow my fears and use the sigil. We're officially tied for best run yet. Only two runs have made it here, and only one has made it to the next boss. First things first, there's a flood of important stuff I need to do. Let's start with the basics. My pixel served me well, but the solar flare pickaxe will allow me to mine luminite and exodium from the sky. Next, it was time to get my weapon in order. Taking my Terra Prisma, Plantation Stuff, Luminite Bars, and Galactica Singularities, I crafted the Enchanted Axe. Because of the Enchanted Axe, I'm going back to Summoner, so I'm re-equipping my minion accessories. Speaking of accessories, the Angel Treads finally have an upgrade, and it's really good. Angel Treads, when combined with any wings and Luminite Bars, results in Celestial Traces. Traces combine wings and running boots into one accessory, saving a slot. Compared to Fishron Wings, it's faster, but has shorter flight time. Next I crafted the Eye of Magnus, a classless sidearm to use when enemies are out of whip range. The Eye of Magnus applies Marked for Death, meaning afflicted targets take more damage. This allows me to buff my minions even more from a safe distance. To finish off my new kit, I crafted the Stardust Armor Set, giving me an army of minions with massive damage. With wings and boots in one, I had an accessory slot to fill, and I have the perfect choice, the community. The community is an accessory that provides offense, defense, and mobility. It's a unique accessory, as the benefits scale with the amount of bosses defeated. Using this accessory gives me the perfect excuse to finish off the bosses I skipped, since they would actually give me stats. With a maxed out community on my progression and a full summoner build, it was time to take on the Dragon Folly. I was extremely nervous. My best run ever had died to this boss. I took a deep breath and I summoned it.
was done. I finally surpassed my previous best. It felt like one burden had finally been lifted from my shoulders and another three added in its place. I had no previous attempts to give me strategies for the rest of the game. I had to improvise from here on out. The next thing to do was crystal clear though. Defeat the chicken nuggets. I mean, the chicken nuggets. Sorry, chicken nuggets. Uh, the profane guardians. The Guardians were pretty easy, I was more worried about Providence. This was the first boss after Moonlord that felt like a true run killer. To make sure I was ready, I practiced Providence for 2 hours straight on a duplicate character on a practice world. Here is every single death. Out of all those practice fights, I only won three times, but I felt more confident and decided to risk it all. I loaded up my real character in my real world. Here's the uncut fight, including all of the audio.
Holy fuck. Holy shit. <laughs> Holy fuck. I'm post Provi, baby. I'm post Providence. Holy fuck. I'm there's a few footnotes for the Providence fight that I do need to explain. Firstly, for gear, I switched over to Calamity's new class, Rogue. I had not touched a Rogue since the nerfs to stealth, however Luna Kunai are insanely strong at this point in progression. Luna Kunai benefit greatly from attack speed buffs from the Glove of Recklessness, and it causes the Ethereal Exhorter to spit out a ton of homing souls for even more damage. Secondly, I chose to fight Providence in the Underworld. She has an exclusive drop based on the biome you choose to fight her in. In the Hollow, she drops the Elysian Wings, which I didn't need yet. The Underworld reward, the Elysian Aegis, was immediately useful to me. Sure, I lose some debuff immunities, but I get a 28 block dash, which is much faster than 18 blocks. After I finished the Provi fight, I did stop recording, but all I did was fish for blood fins, so you didn't miss much. Once Providence goes down, Eula Bloom Ore appears in the jungle biome. It's basically Chlorophyte, but brown. It's used for a ton of stuff, but for now, I only use it for the Elderberry, the third of the four Calamity max HP buffs. I was now only one more upgrade away from having max HP. Since I have to defeat Providence again for the wings, I decide to switch from the Luna Kunai to a post-Providence weapon to ease the fight. I craft up the chain from the Crystalline until I get a Shattered Sun, which is a super powerful splitting dagger. Here's the refight, I sped it up just because it's basically the same. I don't have much to add here, the fight was pretty easy and I threw the wings into storage basically immediately. I was fully done with Providence now and I was starting to feel a lot more comfortable again, so I decided the next thing I'd do is have a test fight against Cygnus, just to see how it'd go. Whoa. 
Running this back, my reaction is actually killing me. For context, before this point, the last time I fought Cygnus was like over a year ago. I pulled up, killed this boss, and said whoa like it wasn't even cool. If only the other two sentinels were this easy, man. The three sentinels drop a different material each, the three combining to make the summon for the Devour of Gods, one of the most terrifying fights in the game. Cygnus drops Twisting Nether, a resource that I can also use for an incredibly strong weapon called the Seven Striker. This is basically the coin gun if it was a mechanically interesting weapon. I won't be using it yet, but it's nightmarishly strong in the right situations. The next boss I'm fighting is Stormweaver, and now's the time that melee really steps up as a good option. I went with a generic melee build with Tarragon armor, which is crafted with Eula Bloom, and for a weapon I picked up the Morning Star, which is the post-providence upgrade to the Solar Eruption. The last accessory was a tech choice specific to this fight though. The Transformer is frankly kind of bad and only has a few niche use cases. This is one of them though. It cuts the damage from the lightning attack in half, and removes the scariest part of the fight, which is the Electrified debuff. I spent a bit of time relearning the fight on a practice world since I was very afraid of the high damage numbers, but I got confident pretty quickly, only the end of phase 2 could really stop me. With Stormweaver down, only one more sentinel remained. I carved out an arena in the dungeon, and decided to practice. This is where things started to fall apart. I tried different strategies, different classes, but the fight just didn't click. I gave up and decided my time should be spent learning a different fight instead. I ended the session and decided tomorrow, I'd focus on Poltergast. The next day was even worse. I actually learned the Poltergast fight really quickly, thanks to it not changing too much over the years, and then I took on the fight, and then I won. A few minutes later, disaster struck. My power went out. My footage was destroyed. I recovered what I could, but it looks terrible. I will upload the footage as a separate video on my second channel, but for now, here's the recreation of the fight. Alright. So this is a... me trying to repeat this... uh, in the modern year of 2024. This is still on the old version of Calamity, so everything should be the same. My community is, like, maxed out, because I'm on like a fucked up world that has everything, uh, yeah, has everything. Um, but I'm also like, this is like made up for by the fact that I have not touched this game in such a long time because I've been working on the editing. So let's see if I can actually do this for realsies. Oh. I'm mega washed, okay. It's actually crazy how bad I am. How do I have the concoction on cooldown? Damn. I... That's crazy. Okay.
Okay, I actually did it in three attempts. Oh, bro. It's actually crazy how much worse I am now. In the remainder of the corrupted footage, I made Blood Flare Armor, a super strong armor set with great sustain and great damage. I also equipped the Affliction, a nice stat buff accessory. With Poltergeist defeated, the bottom of the abyss beckons to me, with the incredible loot now available. I farm at the bottom layer, picking up a lot of cool stuff, most notably the Eidolon Staff, Reaper Teeth, and the best grappling hook in the game, the Bobbit Hook. I had a score to settle with the Ceaseless Void. I tried a ton of different post Baltagas weapons and gear before settling on the Halley's Inferno for Dark Energies, and the Seven Striker once again for dealing damage to the boss. Once I discovered this, I double recalled to reset the fight, ready to finish off Ceaseless Void once and for all. That final attack made me very nervous, but it was done. There are now only four major bosses left in the game, and that old guy that I hate. These four bosses are a cut above the rest in terms of difficulty. First was the Master of the Three Sentinels, the Devourer of Gods. I had some sense of a plan for the Devourer fight, but acting on it is another story. I made the choice to go for a mage build, taking the Last Prism and Dark Plasma from Ceaseless Void, I crafted the Dark Spark. A magic weapon with high damage and infinite pierce, it's perfect for any worm boss. Here's the build I'll be using for this fight. My armor choice was the Prismatic armor set, having an overall superior damage output compared to Blood Flare. My main weapon, of course, was the Dark Spark. The Eyeline stuff is there just in case charging up the full beam doesn't make sense. The accessory loadout is fairly simple. Boots, dash, stat accessories, a dodge, and standard mage stuff. Because this fight is so much harder than everything else up to this point, I decided I needed to practice. You know what that means. Here's the Death Taj.
Alright, this is it. I'm going for it. Oh my god, holy shit. The Devourer was dead. It took a moment to process it. Most people who ever play hardcore give up before the first boss. Yet here I was, despite all of the odds. I knew I had to bring it home from here. Another death would certainly break my spirit. The Devourer's treasure bag was incredibly encouraging, as there are two really cool items that drop. First, in Hardcore Death Mode, there's an exclusive pet drop. I had always looked at this accessory and wanted to get it, and I had finally gotten my hands on one legitimately. Next is possibly the most overpowered Hardcore Mode accessory. With the Nebulous Core equipped, any lethal hit will not kill you, instead putting you to 100 HP with a 90 second cooldown. On top of this, you get 10% more damage and a buff Spore Sack. Before I start upgrading my gear, I set up a little shrine for the Cosmic Plushie. I would equip it and use it, but if it gets too dark, the pet actually attacks you. The three hard mode time-based events get significantly buffed after the DOG goes down. I farm for the three event materials, Dark Sun Fragments, Nightmare Fuels, and Endothermic Energies. These three materials combine with Poltoplasm to make Ascendant Spirit Essence, which is used in almost every single upcoming recipe. With Ascendant Spirit Essence and Cosmolite, I can start upgrading my gear. Hallow Providence's Wing Drop is finally used here, the Elysian Wings combining with Celestial Traces, Ascendant Spirit Essence, and Cosmolite to create Elysian Traces. These traces have better horizontals, better verticals, more acceleration, and longer wing time. It's strictly better in every single way. 
Spirit Essence and Cosmolite also combine Asgard's Valor and the Elysian Aegis to make the Asgardian Aegis. The improvement is less notable, but you get immunity to most debuffs in the game, and some more defense on top, which is never bad. For the rest of the night, I crafted different weapons and tried out different classes, but nothing in particular seemed to stick. I ended the night very happy with my progress, though. After taking on the DOG, I took a 3 day break. I wanted some time to refocus before preparing for the next boss. I started playing again, but didn't start recording until later. Thankfully, all I did off camera was build a full size arena for Yaron. I did figure out what the best build for me was during my break, and I started with Silver Armor, specifically the Mage Set. For the first spell, I pick up a Spell Tome from the Wizard, which combines with Adamantite and Forbidden Fragments to create the Relic of Ruin. Next, I hunt down Giant Climbs to get the Poseidon, which combines with the Razorblade Typhoon from Duke Fishron to get the Nuclear Fury. Turns out, I already had the third spellbook, so I crafted the Event Horizon. For Mage Accessories, the Sigil of Calamitous can now reach its final upgrade, the Ethereal Talisman. This is also the final Mana Flower upgrade. This means I effectively combined my two most used Mage Accessories from before into one taking the damage output from the Sigil, and the ease of use from the Mana Flower, this accessory is incredible for any mage build. To fill the empty slot, I craft a second Sigil of Calamitous, stacking my damage output even more. I also finally upgrade my early hard mode dodge, the Amalgamated Brain, into the Amalgam. Despite waiting so long for this upgrade, it's not too much better than the Amalgamated Brain. The main feature of the upgrade, keeping your buff potions after you die, is completely useless to me. However, the 10% damage boost is upgraded to 15%, so it is still worth using. Now it's time to reveal the Yaron build. This one is a bit more technical compared to the Devourer build I used. Let's start with the armor. My choice was obvious. The silver set has incredible stats and an incredible set bonus. The revivability means I can afford to drop the Nebulous Core for this fight. My main weapon was the Event Horizon, which does incredible DPS if you can hit all of the projectiles. The accessories are more interesting. Despite just unlocking the Elysian Tracers, I never actually use them, instead opting for Silver Wings. Aerial mobility is key in this fight, so the better movement and better wing time is so good that I can drop all of my foot speed for it. Silver Wings also make the Death Prevention set bonus even stronger. Asgardian Aegis is obviously the best choice for my dash, there's no notes for this one. The Amalgam, only dodge with the damage boost, you already know. Accessory 4 is where things get interesting. I actually dropped the community for the Reaper Tooth Necklace, and in hindsight, I should have done it for DOG too. My goal for this fight was kill the boss fast, so using the strongest pure damage with no drawback accessory just logically followed. Accessory 5 is actually a ranger accessory. The Dynamo Stem Cells provide immunity to Dragonfire, which is a debuff that melts your HP very fast. The logic for this is the exact same as using the Alchemical Flask for the Plaguebringer. The last two accessories are the Sigil of Calamitous and Ethereal Talisman, which are key to any late game mage build. This build was crafted from a lot of practice in another world. Let me quickly show you. All of that preparation aside, I present to you the Dragon of Rebirth.
Holy fucking shit, dude. Holy shit. Holy shit. Holy shit. Holy shit. Holy fuck. Holy fucking shit, dude. There's an... Oh my god. Oh shit! Yo, 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 wait, 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 Holy fuck. The dragon is down, boys. Let's go. Okay. 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 Where do we go from here? That's a good question. We'll find out soon. Holy fuck. Oh my god. Oh, dude. Allow me to retrospect for a moment. This run started as a way for a depressed 16 year old to ruin his favorite video game as some sort of twisted mental game. I told myself it would be just for a video and to finally make a name for myself in the community, but these were only secondary. Things continued this way for a while until attempt 314. That death hit me at a really bad moment. After that point, things continued to get worse. It seemed like bad thing after bad thing kept happening in real life too. It took a lot of time to come to grips with myself, but I returned eventually. I came back to prove myself to, well, myself, I guess. I've died a hundred times since that run. I can't let myself lose from here. Alright, so anyway, when I picked up the treasure bag, I got a whole bunch of stuff, but I only really needed three key items. These items are the Druze Wings, the Dragon Rage, and Yarn Soul Fragments. I head underground to mine for the next door available for what I hope to be the last time. This time, it's Auric Ore, which I can craft into Auric Bars. Off camera, I also crafted the Dragon Fruit, which is the final HP upgrade, bringing my base HP to 600. When I said I never actually used the Elysian Traces, this is what I mean. I take the Druze Wings from Yaron, Auric Bars, and my Elysian Traces to create the final upgrade. Seraph Traces are incredible, being the second best wings in the game, narrowly behind Druze Wings. On top of this, if you take 200 or more damage in a single hit, you get half a second of extra invincibility. With Master and Death Modes, this means every single boss hit will give you extra iframes. There are only three more things I need to do before I fight Calamitous. Make an arena, max out the community, and prepare my build. I build the shell of the arena by hand before using external tools to finish it. Next, since I plan to use the community for Calamitous, it's time to deal with a boss that I've been skipping. That's right, it's finally time to take out Puke Fishron. I'm terrible at this fight, but because I'm hyper carried by my overpowered auric gear, this fight ends up pretty easy. I spent the next three days grinding Supreme Calamitous on my test character. I wish I recorded for a montage here, but all I can show you is my attempt counter on the test character. Now all I had to do was get my gear in order. I had not anticipated the build I would end up using. I had already crafted the ranged and magic helmets, but not the melee helmet. Combining the three post Moonlord melee helmets with auric bars, I crafted the auric tesla royal helm. For the first and only time, I'm using three weapons for a boss. One for main DPS, one for group DPS, and one for sepulcher phases. First on the menu is the King of Flails and my main DPS, the Dragon Pal. This flail is made with seven other flails all throughout the game's progression, with Yaron Soul Fragments and Auric Bars to combine them. I already had four of these flails, and the remaining three are trivial to obtain. I started with the Tumbleweed, which needs a Sun Fury, a Grand Scale, and Souls of Might. I was only missing the Sun Fury, which I opened Obsidian Lockboxes to get. Next was the Tao of Pal, which I already had the materials to craft. Finally, the Urchin Flail is sold by the Sea King. Very easy. Combining these seven flails, I crafted the Dragon Pal, which has incredible single target DPS, with the downside of being annoyingly loud. My group DPS was the King of Vanilla, the Zenith. This weapon is hilarious to me. The only change from vanilla is adding auric bars to the recipe, and despite the tear shift and power creep, it remains as one of the best melee weapons in the entire game. 
It would be poetic to use a copper short sword from the beginning of the run here, but it was quite literally the first item I ever trashed in every single run. I crafted all of the missing swords, finally putting it together. The zenith was now in my hands, and it was glorious. I felt that a defensive accessory was needed because of how deadly Calamitous is. The ramp out of deities, an accessory I overlooked previously, was the best choice here. I don't use defensive accessories too often, mainly due to my playstyle and the hit cap. At this point, the hit cap's impact on the run is pretty small, but it does prevent fully defensive builds from just cheesing bosses. The main reason I like this accessory is the 10 extra iframes on hit. These stack with my traces, meaning every hit gives me 40 frames or 2 thirds of a second of immunity. The other two great effects are faster healing cooldowns, and you take 15% less damage if you're below half HP. There are a few other benefits which are less impactful, but still nice. The second accessory is an offensive one. The Elemental Gauntlet is one of the strongest melee accessories in the game. It's crafted by combining a Fire Gauntlet with Luminite Bars, Galactica Singularities, and Ascendant Spirit Essence. For maximum damage, I reforged some of my accessories to a mix of Lucky and Menacing. This optimal setup gives guaranteed crits on the Zenith and 92% on my other two weapons. To recap my build, here's the graphic. Auric Tesla Melee Set, Dragon Power Main DPS, with the Zenith and Dragon Rage for my two sidearms. My accessories are Traces, Shield, Dodge, Community, Rampart of Deities, Nebulous Core which is a revive, and the Elemental Gauntlet. I will defeat her. There's no option to lose. I didn't have this whole quote unquote character arc for nothing, right?
Oh shit. Holy fuck, holy fuck, holy fuck, holy fuck, holy fuck. Holy shit. Holy shit. Oh my god. I... Okay. Okay, it's done. It's done. The Wicked Witch is dead, boys. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Holy shit. Holy fuck. One more. One boss remains. But I could have chosen to fight Calamitous last, which most people do. So why didn't I? It came down to experience. I've spent a lot more time with Calamitous compared to the Exos, so I felt Calamitous, while generally considered harder, would be easier for me. She also gives access to two items that would certainly improve my odds at defeating the final boss. First, Gale's Greatsword is a death mode exclusive sword which is my weapon of choice. Each swing cycles through three attacks, firing off two homing skulls, a giant skull, and a true melee attack. It also has a unique rage mechanic where ripping rage instead fires a ton of skulls around you before going on cooldown. This is where the next item comes in. Calamitous has the ability to turn the community into a shattered community. This provides almost the same stats as a maxed out community, trading life regen for extra flight, but of course that's not all. With the shattered community equipped, you also passively gain rage no matter what. On top of this, dealing damage with rage active will increase your rage level. After grinding the shattered community to the max level 25, rage mode does an absurd 25% more damage. The community was already a fantastic accessory, but this might be too much. After Yaron, I took three days before returning for the next boss. Calamitous? A few hours. I wanted to finish this run desperately. I grinded a ton of exomech fights for 5 hours straight, learning the ins and outs of the fight. No footage of this, but I died a lot. By hour 4, I had a plan for the fight, and by the 5th, I decided to gamble my run in what possibly could have been the dumbest thing I ever do in my life. My build was identical to Calamitous, except with the Shattered community over the normal one. I also switched over to Violent Reforges so I could fire skulls with the Gale's Greatsword as fast as I could. I knew I was taking a risk, but I felt strangely confident. I learned the fight pretty quickly, finding tricks to make certain sections much less dangerous. All I had to do was not choke.
Holy shit. Nine months of my life. Oh my god, dude, nine months of my life spent doing this shit. I'm gonna fucking cry, dude. It's finally over. I ended my recording there. I went to talk to my family who knew some of what was going on with the run. I cried genuine tears of joy. It was a strange feeling I can only look back and smile at. I've never been racked with so much pure positive emotion in my life. Finally, I could look back at something I've done and actually say, good job, dude. I started this run as a depressed 16 year old, I finished it as a 17 year old, and now I'm 18, finalizing the voiceover and editing this. It's been a year and a half since I started, nine months playing and another nine making this video. I went through script after script, got demotivated, got a bit lazy, finished high school, and a lot of stuff has happened in my life over this time. It feels weird finally releasing this video. It's sort of a capstone to this entire segment of my life. I'm off to university this year, and things are gonna continue to change. As for the run itself, it's still unknown exactly how many people have done Master Death Hardcore. I know I'm definitely in the 2nd to 5th range though. I can say I was first to do it with a boss hit cap, even if it ended up being mostly insignificant. I'm releasing the quality of life mod with the hit cap item, world, and character download. These will be available in the Steam Workshop and through links in the description respectively. The 415th story might end here, standing victorious, but my story hasn't. Cause next time we're doing something that's never been done before.